So uh, it's a talk in two parts, so obviously. And before uh, studying that, I think the, the story that you know that most of the work that we do is in fact done with the help of, because of other people. And here for part one, uh, Cheryl uh, is, was one of the big, big helper, and we are happy to have her here. And for part two, the big helper is uh, Derek uh, Beaton, uh, a student at UTD. So let's go to the overview, as the title indicates, I'm going to talk about multi-table uh, models for connectivity, and probably you wonder what is a multi-table. Well, all of you, I think, have heard at least about principal component analysis, where you try to understand the information in one table. Well, if you have several tables, like, multiple, like uh, the one you use in PCA, you are in the case of multi-table analysis. And in part one, I'm going to talk about what to do when our tables are made of correlation matrices or something like a correlation matrix, uh, anything linked to in the common information between two ROIs. And then we're going to use as an illustration the data from Cheryl and on a problem of age-related changes in connectivity. In part two, we're going now to move from literally one type of tables to two types of tables. And the idea is that can we put or can we try to understand or explain connectivity by some other information? And that can be behavior. In other words, can we link the changes in connectivity to change in behavior? Or in that case, can we link the change in connectivity to uh, differences in genetic background? And here, the technique we're going to uh, look at is variation over PLS or partial least square and a variation called partial least square correspondence analysis. And then we're going to look at the sub-network of addiction. It's not going to be wine, it's just going to be uh, marijuana there. So that's the reference uh, if you want to uh, read more. Now, part one, the large. No, that, okay. So what, uh, the part one is what to do with uh, correlation-based connectivity uh, matrices. So in general, this is what we start with. We have a brain, but in fact, in the brain, we're going to have our eyes, and we're interested in is to try to create links between these our eyes. But this is what we're going to start with. We're going to start with a correlation matrix, and we want to get some information out of that. So if we want to have a way of transforming a correlation matrix into a picture, this is part of the Euclidean toolbox. So what is that? Well, it's a great toolbox because it's something that works with the Pythagorean theorem, and I know for sure that this is the only theorem that everybody knows in here. So that means that in there, a lot of notions are completely natural, like mean variance, inertia, and so on. And for those of us who love to minimize sum of square, you have a magic called the Eigen magic. And because it's a magic that a lot of us use, you have a lot of great routine, which means that we can analyze a huge data set, which you will not be able to do if you were to use standard combinatorics. And it generalizes beautifully. You can add masses and weight. And for those of us who are statisticians, we can reach paradise if normality is around and IID things. So now, how does it work for correlation? Well, for correlation, you start with a matrix of correlation. And uh, the, you do some eigenmagic. And that eigenmagic is going to transform that matrix into the picture. So you put eigenmagic, and you've got the magician doing that. And it's going to give us coordinates, which we call eigenvectors. And the variants of these coordinates are called the eigenvalues. This is, in other words, the eigen decomposition. And the great thing there is that if you have elements that you have not used, you can project them with the same thing so you can see what they would do in that space. Now, standard idea when you have a correlation matrix, so this is what most people will do, is that they have somewhere in their book something called multidimensional scaling, or MDS, that is also known by biologists as principal coordinate analysis. Simple idea, you transform the correlation into a distance, and you just, your distance is 1 minus the correlation. We'll go from 0 to, uh, to 2 for the maximum distance, and 0 when two things are exactly the same. And then you go for MDS. Now, but what is MDS? How do you do that? But it's, it's really not new, because it's something that started, in fact, in the late uh, 30s. And you start with, so you have your distance, and you want that map. You want the map uh, so that the distance there in the table are going to be the distance on the map. But how do you do that? Well, you do something bizarre. You start, in fact, you remember that when you do PCA, you compute a covariance matrix, and you do some magic there. The eigen magic is there. It gives us our PCA. And in fact, that's what is equivalent to a distance, a Euclidean distance. So when you have a distance matrix, what do you do? Well, you, you start there, and you want to go there. But the problem is that the eigen magic does not work there. So you need to do something bizarre. You go to a covariance. You transform that into a covariance. So how do you do that now? 
you are going to use something that is called double centering. So what, what is that idea? First thing is that your distance goes the wrong way to go for a correlation. Correlation is uh, when you highly correlated, its high distance is low. So you, first thing, you take a minus sign, which is the easiest way of transforming that. And then you are going to eliminate the effect of the rows and the colon, and the pompous name of that is a double centering. And if you use matrices, you just have that the one half is just there because it's cute. But the, the big thing is minus, and then you, you, for those of us who remember analysis of variance, it looks strikingly like an analysis of variance story, and it is. So we transform the, the distance into covariance, and then we do an eigen decomposition, and problem is solved. Well, I think, uh, so, uh, right. Okay, so this is a connectivity correlation matrix. So let's look at it. So you can say, like, let's do some eigen magic, and I've got, I've got my plot. So yeah, it's looked beautiful. I've got uh, my four region. Now, it looks good for one matrix. What about two matrices? So here I've got two matrices, do the analysis. And then I've got something that is completely bizarre. And the reason why we have something that is hard to make sense of is that the centers of these matrices are in different places. And that's the big problem. So how do we do that to get rid of that where well, we do a double centering? And if you think it's a new idea, it's not a new idea. It's the first one to mention that, at least to my knowledge, is Horse. In, in a book that is still a great reading on factor analysis of data matrices, a lot of the ideas that we use now are there in that book. And in fact, Horse called that ipsative measurement. I love that word because it's one of these completely obscure words. And they just mean that for a matrix, the information you, are, you have depends upon the center of the matrix. So it's only relative to that uh, matrix. So how do you do when you have those things where you need to eliminate that effect? And well, you're back to double centering. Here you are with the formula. But now it looks exactly like the same thing, except we don't have a minus sign there. Okay? So two centered matrix, and they plot. And so it's great. Now we can see that A4 and B4 are really talking about the same thing, that A2 is not too far from B2, and that A1 and A3 are, are uh, now close to the center, the common center. Now, but if we have several correlation matrices, is it enough uh, to have that? So uh, let's look at uh, two new centered matrices, and I'll put them together. Well, there is, uh, there is a problem there, I think, and the problem is the length problem. It's hard to compare them because the length that we have on the first dimension is not the same. And once again, that means that, in fact, each matrix has got its own length, length, its own unit of measurement. So we need to eliminate that. Well, how do we do that? If you were to live with one variable, we will use a z-score. The z-score, you subtract the mean, so it will be going to a double centering. And you eliminate the unit by, doing, by dividing by the standard deviation. Well, for matrices, remember, eigenvalues are variances. So square root of that is what we call a singular value. Well, you can divide by the first singular value. And now all first pieces are equal. So let's look at that. We call that lambda 1, divide everything by that. And now, uh, so same thing. It's not a new idea. The first one to really think clearly about that was Brigitte Escoffier in the uh, early 80s. Granted, it's in French, so if you don't read French, this is uh, the equivalent in English. And so if I do that, now I've normalized this one, and now you can see that these two matrices, in fact, share exactly the same first dimension, and that uh, the, these two ones were telling us the same story, but the second dimension is created by that separation that is not created for the first matrix. Okay, so moral of the story, if you need to compare connection matrices, we need to center them and we need to normalize them. Now, what about more than two? Well, now we need to integrate that. And so now all that family is the so-called STATIS family. And now if you wonder what STATIS means, it's a horrible acronym for something as horrible as that in French, which is Structuration des tableaux à trois indices de la statistique. It does not make more sense, frankly, in French than in English. So, uh, but it says that it's a way of doing things for a three table. Now, uh, it's part of the Euclidean three-way toolbox for where you try to have now, you have a brick of data, and out of that brick, well, what do you want to have? You want to have the equivalent of factor scores, but with factor scores for the whole family of tables and for each of them. And you want to know what is creating these factor scores, so you want to have the equivalent of loadings again. And if you have just distance matrices or correlation matrices, well, you use the Procustean family, and in here, they become called distatis or copstatis. Same thing, if you want all the detail of that, go to my homepage and to the reference on that. Now, picture two of that. So suppose we have four people and four connection uh, matrices. So the first thing we do, we've got that R matrix that we know uh, uh, is going to be represented as, uh, with its own center. So we center and norm that. And now we want to, you have one matrix per participant and we want to integrate them. 
Well, what does that mean to integrate? Well, integrate is to compute something like a mean. And what does that say? I mean, it's just something, we are going to call that a compromise, and it's just something that is going to be a linear combination. And, but what do we want for that linear combination? Well, we want that linear combination to be the best possible, so it should tell us the most information we can have. So to find them, we're going to mix that, and we're going to want that to be optimum. Optimum will mean that if you look like everybody else, I want to give you a strong weight. If you are, if you are an outlier, I still want to integrate your data, but I'm not going to give you a strong weight. So I want to weight that. So it means that if I want to do that, if I want to have something that is similar, most similar to the matrices, I need to define a coefficient of similarity between matrices. So, and this is what is called the RV coefficient. How do you do that? You take your matrices, you vectorize all that, and now you just compute the cross product between all that, sum all that, and it's something that looks very much like a coefficient of correlation, except it's not centered. And problem with that, it's, uh, it's, we still have the units between these matrices, so if we normalize, we are going to eliminate that. And this is the definition of the so-called RV coefficient. Now, it looks a bit scary like that, but the trace is a great way because this is what we use when we minimize, when we want to prove that. Computation, if you want to show that it's a scalar product, this is that. Computation only, this is that. Now, big thing is just a way that is just a generalization of the coefficient of correlation that tell us how much information two matrices share. And this is a squared coefficient of correlation, in fact. So it goes between zero and one, zero when they, you have independence, one when the matrix are the same, up to a dilatation or rotation. So we've got our four people, each of them give us a matrix, and now we have a table where we have the uh, equivalent of the similarity between matrices. If we analyze that, that will be like an eigen decomposition, a PCA. We just something strange is that the first dimension is gonna be all positive, because that first dimension is capturing communality. The higher you are on the dimension, the more communality you have. The closer you are to the center, the more original or the more of an outlier you are. And so the idea is that we're just going to use this projection and the weight of our linear combination. So we go for that, we rescale to one, and we have now our compromise, which is just the linear combination. Now I've got, let me now, I've got something that is the best correlation matrix I could find. So I can do another PC of that, and that's going to tell me what's going on in terms of the uh, ROIs. Now, if you want to know what we minimize, this is what we minimize. Oh, well, sorry, we maximize the similarity. Okay, so how good is the compromise? We can do the standard thing for PCA, uh, uh, explain variance, and so on. So just a sketch of what we've been doing. We've been doing that, and I've got uh, that data, and this is what I'm going, that table, and this is what I'm going to eigen decompose. Now, when I've got that, the great thing here that, so we've got something that is common, but I would like to know about every specific person. So to do that, I'm just going to project in that same space, everybody, so this is our uh, subject number one. I can see our subject number one is looking at the whole space. In fact, I can do that for everybody, and I can project back in the space everybody and see what are the places where I have, let's say, a large variance or a small variance in there. Now, big thing that is descriptive, what we really need to know is, is the Earth round? And you probably remember it's a, uh, a marvelous paper from, by uh, Jacob Cohen, where he essentially makes the point, he does a beautiful attack on the null hypothesis testing, except there's one thing that is ironic there, is that we all know, even though we know that null hypothesis testing makes no sense, that, that, that we know that uh, the APA wanted to ban them, but however, we know that if we send a beautiful paper to our favorite uh, journal with something that does not say P.05 somewhere, we know that we're in trouble. So how can we do something that is linked to, that looks at least like hypothesis testing? We need to derive confidence interval. What standard worth doing is bootstrap. So now what is the bootstrap? Well, bootstrap is one of these silly names invented by Efron, and I think he invented that because he was jealous of Tuki with the jackknife. You know, because Jackknaf is a name that says nothing about what the technique is, so Bootstrap does not say anything about what the technique is either. So, uh, and, but the, the great idea there, uh, the idea is awfully simple. It's beautiful. The, the idea is that we need to mimic what we do when we do standard stat. And when we do standard stat to derive confidence interval, we start with the population and we sample from that population. The great thing when we sample for a population is that the probability of being uh, selected twice is the same as being selected once time once. So that means we don't change the probability when we select from infinity. No, it's the reason why that infinity minus one is still infinity, so you don't change anything. So if you want to mimic that, and if you decide that the only thing you have is the sample, you need to do the same thing. 
So if you want your sample to mimic a population, you need to have the probability of being picked up, not changing. But to do that, well, if you select something, put it back. Let's see how you can do. This is a magic hat. This is the bootstrap hat. So put that in, in there, you know, bootstrap hat, and you shake that guy, and uh, the, uh, you take a first one, so you've got A, you put it in, you, you copy it, put it in there, and now you put it back in the, in the hat, shake again, okay? So, and now you're going to do that for a second one, second one, uh, okay? Third one, I, I, I didn't shake there, but you have the story. We're supposed to shake there again. And so this is what we have. That could be a bootstrap sample. So and, uh, th that is the, the following story that when you do a bootstrap sample or when you sample with replacement, some are repeated and some are lost, and this is the consequence of keeping the probability identical. From that, if you do a lot of this, uh, you, you create boot, uh, your new sample, and you remember the story about projecting, but well, you can still project them in that same space, so you can project one, two, and 1,000 of them, and you can try to uh, get that, summarize all that with confidence ellipsoid or convex hulls. And there you will have, that one will tell you that these things are not separable, taking into account your data, and these things are separable. Now, if you want to cross the line, you can say they are significantly different, but some people who are purists will tell you you cannot say something like that. But at least you can say they are separable. So it's the chicken wood. So now, uh, let's look at something that could be an illustration, and this is here, this is the uh, work done with Natasha Kovacevic, Cheryl uh, Grady here, and uh, Randy McIntosh. And so in here we had 47 healthy adults that were dividing in, in uh, three groups, young, middle-aged, and mature. You will note that we don't get old anymore. Okay. We are just mature there. So, and the task here, we had four, uh, four tasks that in fact are not things that we're interested in now, but we, so we will need to try to integrate over that. And we do uh, imaging, we do pre-processing and, and, and all these uh, gorgeous things that uh, Natasha did marvelously well. And so now we have 76 times two because we have two parts of the brain, 152 hour eyes that are anatomically based. And that gives something like that. So if I look at, whoops, if I look at participant number one, this is the fourth, the fourth run of uh, this participant. For each of these runs, we are going to derive a correlation matrix that says the connectivity between uh, these 152 uh, regions. So when uh, we've got all that, we've got all that for up to for participant one, up to 47 in here. And so we're going, the first step is that we're going to integrate these four matrices into just one because we don't really care about the task. We want to see what is common in there in terms of connectivity. And now, we are going, now we, have, we have one matrix per person, and we're going to unfold this matrix to try to get a common information. So we're going to do, in fact, a double status on that. So I've done the first optimization, and I'm go going to do a second optimization, going to get factor scores on one side and loadings for the connection. So let's look at the factor scores. Here, if I look at the average factor scores, I have a first dimension that separates the young for the middle age and the mature. Now, uh, is that separation real? Does that, will that stand uh, the bootstrap? And what that says, they say, in fact, the real strong difference is between the young, middle, uh, middle age, and old on one side. But also you have something that is quite intriguing, is that you have also a very clear effect of variance, is that the old or the mature will show a larger variance than the middle age. As if you, in fact, they break, in fact, into group, one group looking still like the middle age and the other one looking more mature. Now, how can we get the important ROIs there and the connection? So we're going to square these loadings. And from that, the, the reason why we're going to square that, remember Pythagorean theorem, when you square stuff, you can add them up. So we're going to do that and going to look at the square loadings for all ROIs. So here in that horrible thing, what you have, you have one line, okay, one of these little bars represent uh, one uh, ROI, and they are in green when they're on the right, and they are in uh, lavender when they are on the left. And I don't know about you, but I think <laughs> you know, it's, it's artistic, but it's hard to get anything out of that. So we're going to try to uh, bootstrap that and try to clean all that. And we found that when we threshold the contribution, try to find out what can survive that, well, we just have a much smaller number uh, of ROIs that are going to survive. When I look at these ROIs now, I, what I'm going to do, I'm going to compute the partial factor scores, so the factor scores for each of my three groups, young, middle-aged, and old, and this is what I have. So that says that now when you look at, this, uh, um, at these ROIs, you see the clean difference in here between the young and the two other groups. So you can see that what we've got here on the ROI is mimicking what we had when we were looking at the factor scores. 
Now, if we want to know the whole story about something marvelously unreadable but artistic, we could not resist doing that, that, that one. So here, what you've got are the 152 ROIs, and we've put in there the connection that survived the bootstrap. So you can see which one are stronger in the young and stronger in the uh, middle and mature uh, uh, population. Okay. So if we try to wrap all that up, what do we get in terms of the connectivity? Well, we end up with the fact that the young differ from the middle age and the old group, and we can get the uh, uh, ROIs in that case that are responsible for that. So that one was the, the so that shows part one where we can use now uh, different connectivity matrices, several connectivity matrices per person, and you can do, in fact, group analysis, and even if you have structure on the group. You can see what we're trying to do that. We're trying to get to the equivalent of an analysis of variance. Well, now that, if, that I realize that, well, is, what could be great in some cases is to try to see if we can have connectivity on one side, but I would like to put that connectivity in relation with something like, do the, can I put in relation connectivity and behavior or connectivity, let's say, and genetics? And that brings us to part two, the large. Okay, no, from one table to two table uh, in there, and where we want to uh, connect connectivity to something else. And the idea is, can we find common information, or can we use an external information to dissociate networks? So, and we're going to look at an example. So, oops. Now, and maybe we start with that example because that will tell us what we want to look, to look for. So the question is that, when you look at the network of addiction, are there in fact different networks that are literally mediated by, let's say, different, uh, uh, by different subsystem themselves under the control of some genes? So uh, all that is work that we have done uh, with Francesca Philby, with uh, Derek uh, Beaton, Joseph Dunlop, and she started to work with David. And the idea is that can we see if some genetic markers are linked to that? Markers, what are the markers that are going to be the usual system essentially around the dopaminergic system because this is where reward is. And our eyes, uh, we're going to have standard our eyes such as orbitofrontal cortex, nucleus accumbens, and so on. So let's start with the cue. So there, that, that thing up there, for those of you who are as naive as I am, that thing is a pipe. So it's not, this is the exact inverse of this is not a pipe. That thing is a pipe. Okay, and this is a, a pipe that you are going to use to smoke some of these substances that are illegal, so you are not supposed to do that. Okay? And, and now, when you have that thing, if you even don't smoke, if you are a usual user of this, just having the pipe in the end is enough to give you something like a strong hint of what's going to happen. For, for I think some of us, it's just like having a good glass. Without wine, we can think about the wine when the glass is in there. Okay, so in here, when you start with that subtle, or not very subtle cue, you, you can process that for motivation and you are going to go into the interior singular cortex or it can be plain context and it's going to be the upper compass. Now, if you go from there, then you can have the emotional content that resonates in the amygdala and the insula play a role, something like guide to introspection and all that anyway is going to converge to the big place where you know the real pleasure is the VTA. So, and this is what creates the feeling of craving. And uh, in general, we love, there is one region that I, I personally love because it has been, I found that region uh, all of my life when I was doing work on, on, uh, on food, for example, and taste and food expertise, you are going to find that the orbital frontal cortex is there for everything, for memory, for decision, for taste, for, uh, for pleasure, for so on. So, well, it's hard not to put, the, uh, not to put it in there. And the nucleus accumbens is, is, uh, is among the usual culprit also when uh, everything that is linked to addiction. So we're going to create uh, uh, this uh, uh, set of ROIs. So we have seven ROIs that we want to look at. So amygdala, anterior cingular gyrus, hippocampus, insula, inferior orbitofrontal cortex, nuclear accumbens, and ventral tegmental area. Plus now, uh, we, a bit of the literature is going to tell us that we have some genes that are likely to be, uh, to be involved. So now the big question is, if I know these genes, can I get an idea of, this? can I break my big network in sub-network? Because even with seven uh, regions, it's, it's already a mess in terms of uh, looking at that. So uh, let's, uh, let's look at our design. So here we're going to have only uh, users of marijuana, regular users, uh, seven brain region. We're going to have 48 markers of genes that we call SNPs. I'm going to get back to that in uh, one minute to tell you more about it. And the task in the scanner is that you are going to have either a pipe, okay, or you are going to hold a pencil, one or the other. And for those of us who are 
uh, intellectuals, you know, this is the real reward you know, for us. You know. So the, the, the type of thing that, and you know, that with, uh, something like that, so we really have it. But now, uh, for, uh, if you just happen to be a user of, uh, of these substances, when you, the pipe, if you subtract pipe uh, from uh, pencil, you are supposed to see what network uh, addiction is triggering. So now, uh, the SNP that we're going to look at, in fact, uh, 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 come from a small number of genes that are going to be the usual culprit there. The first one, it makes sense to look at the receptor of marijuana, which is the uh, cannabinoid. And then you are going to look at the antagonist of that one. Uh, dopamine, we know that there is no pleasure without dopamine, so let's go uh, for it. Now, we've got BDNF that is linked to, that we find uh, periodically in brain development cognitive function. And that one, uh, that one is the favorite of Derek, and Derek like it because it's linked to food pleasure. And I have nothing against food pleasure, so I thought it was a great idea to put that uh, there. So the, uh, uh, what do we have now in the data that, that, that we have so far? Now, uh, Francesca and Joseph just worked on it and decided first to use uh, Granger, connect, uh, Granger connectivity or causality. And now we could have used something else. The, the big point there is that we want to find uh, something like a direction of, uh, of information going from here to there. So it's going to be a zero one. Now, uh, remember that Granger is an old stuff coming from econometry. And with all the proper caveats, you can say that it gives you something that is a causal connection. I don't think it's causal, but the, the, the standard idea there. Uh, but anything with zero one will do. And Granger is going to give us directed, directed graph like that. So here we've got the amygdala, we've got an NAC and so on. And this is probably nicer that way. And now, but the way of representing that is in fact a zero one matrix. So if I look at that, I can see that when I have a connection from the amygdala to the ACG, I've got a one, no connection, I've got a zero. These matrices are different from correlation matrices because these ones are not symmetric. The diagonal is zero, it could be one, the, 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 there the diagonal is no importance in there. So I've got one uh, of this matrix per participant uh, that I derive from, uh, the, ana from uh, uh, the analysis of the result. Now, one matrix per person, now, if I want to put all that, what I'm going to do, I'm going to unfold that matrix, I ignore the diagonal, so I'm going to have values of zero and ones here that correspond, in fact, to that matrix. You can see the dots in here. So now, because I've got, uh, 40, uh, I've got uh, 60 participants, I'm going to have uh, 60 of these. And so this is the value uh, in there. So what, what about uh, the, this uh, gene? And let's go back to the SNP. What is a SNP, uh, so that SNP? Well, SNP just comes from the chromosome. When you have, uh, I hope you remember, you have, uh, for, you have two chromosomes, one coming from papa, one coming from mama. And if you look at a given spot, you are going to have in some cases, so you just need to, to, to have one of the, or the other. So here, suppose you have G on top and, and T, and you have one for papa and one for mama. And with two, the combination of two, you in fact 10 possible pardons. But uh, in fact, in practice, for a lot of, of reasons, some technical, some not technical, you just happen to have uh, uh, three possible uh, variants there. You're going to have two homozygotes that can be, let's say, AA or TT, and you're going to have one homozygote that can be AT or TA. We don't know if, uh, if it's AT or TA because we don't know on what chromosome things are. Okay? We just know the two, these two uh, bases. And we call the one we find uh, uh, least in the population a minor allele and the one the, that we find more a major allele. And so what we do in general, what the chip are going to give us, they're going to give us something, they, they count, they're going to count the number of minor alleles, most of them. As usual, some are going to do the inverse. So AA, for example, if A is the, if T is the minor allele, so AA is going to be zero, TA is going to be coded one, and TT is going to be coded two. Now the silly thing to do there is to, is, is to say, oh, that's right, one, we have zero, one, two, that's a number, computer correlation with that. Well, no, it makes no sense. It makes no sense because uh, two there is not, two is not one plus one. Okay, the, uh, and, and so they just say that these pardons are different. So those are qualitative different. We have three different uh, pardons. So let's look at the way we code that. So here we've got now our people here from here. And if you look very carefully here, you are going to see that in here, for example, the first person uh, has got the uh, value of GG and, and so on. So, and which is in fact coded now as a three uh, as a three, zero, uh, one vector, and you have zero for the alleles you don't have and one for the allele that you have. Okay, so, and this is what we have in there. Now, we have two tables there. So we end up with two tables, one for the genes and uh, one for connectivity. 
what to do with that? Well, I want to find if there is something in common in these two tables. And if I think that gene has got something to do with connectivity, that means there is some information that is the same. That, in other words, they would say people with the same connectivities would have the same genes in some ways. Well, if you look at that, uh, that question, it's a standard PLS problem. And in fact, the paper that uh, all of us uh, have used or have learned our PLS from was the paper in 1996 in which we just happened to have two of the authors of that paper are here. So we have Cheryl and we have Jim. And that was uh, when they uh, proposed to use a partial least square to put, in to put together a brain imaging and behavior. Well, now the, so what is PLS? Let me give you a one, two, three PLS. Instead of brain, we have faces. Here we have, let's say, something that corresponds to a behavior. We want to find what is common. And the trick is that we're going to mix the information in the face, in each of the pixel, and the information in the variables to create what we call latent variables, so two linear combination, and we want these things to have the largest covariance. And we're going to call the coefficient loadings or saliences, or in fact, singular vector. Okay, so how you call that? This is our cultural interlude. So after that, if you want to show what you know, in fact, that thing, uh, if you do psychometrics, you call that Tucker interbattery analysis. If you do ecology, you call that co-inertia analysis. And if you do brain imaging, we call that PLS regression. It means that this is the same technique that have been rediscovered in different fields because they were matching different problems. So we uh, if you want a bit of math, that means that we, do, uh, we start with the correlation matrix and we get the latent variable through a singular value decomposition. If you don't want to remember that, it's okay. Just think that we have a trick linked to the eigen magic to have it. So if uh, you lose that, that means if I were to do that, I would take my f uh, these faces or these brain, put them into a matrix, then I will have the equivalent of the, my behavior matrix or the external matrix, compute the correlation between all that, and I decompose that, and I've got that way the, what we call the loadings and the saliences. Now, how to understand the story is that in here that tells you that to create your latent variable, you took essentially uh, 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 0.5 of sex, 0.5 of age, and ignore the uh, wine uh, component in there, and it will give you a new variable, okay? Now, for the face, you, everything that is in red, you are going to give a, let's say, minus one, uh, 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 or something like a uh, uh, negative uh, weight. In gray, you ignore, and in blue, you give a positive weight. Combine all that, it will give you now one number per person, and that number would be the latent variable. And if you look at that, you can say that all that has linked to do with uh, uh, boys, girls, and age. For a reason is that in that sample, first boys are different from girls, if you look at their face. But in my sample, it just happened that the girls were younger than the boys if, uh, in there. And this is what we find. And if you look at the latent variable, this is going to be quite clear there. And remember, what we're maximizing is that similarity. And ideally, we would have that everything on a straight line. So now, that sounds really like the ideal stuff uh, to do two tables analysis. But there is just one problem, that it works with quantitative data because we need to create a correlation matrix, but it just happened that we have nominal data. So we are in trouble there. So what can I do with nominal data? Well, the only thing I think I can do with nominal data is to count, okay? And so the question now is that can we have PLS with a lot of counts? And the idea is that, yeah, you can do the same trick, that you are going to redefine R as being a matrix of counts, and going to decompose that, but you are going to put some constraint on that. So if we do with a break, that means we do the same idea. We compute a co-occurrence matrix, but are, now we need a generalized SVD to do that. We need to impose some constraint. And the great thing now is that we have some magic, and we are going to call that partial least square correspondence analysis. Now, why do we call that correspondence analysis? Because it just happened that we have rediscovered the wheel once again, because that thing is equivalent to a technique called correspondence analysis, which is a favorite of the French world. Nothing new in here again, because the, the first uh, standard explanation of all that is, was in Brigitte Escoffier, PhD thesis in 1968, and you have the, that in Analyse des Correspondances in Ben in 73. So uh, we're, we were very happy to rediscover the wheel, because uh, correspondence analysis is one of the techniques that has been discovered by the largest amount of people. So it has been discovered, you can, you can look that Fisher discovered it, Pearson discovered it, well, these two one, you know, even though they didn't like each other, they discovered the same thing there. And it was rediscovered by Gutmann. It was discovered also by Cyril Bird. So it's one of these things that you are among a lot of people who have rediscovered it. So it's great. So, but in brief, what, uh, what does it give? Latent variables, and it gives us uh, also factor scores. So let's look at the first part of the connection saliency. So here we're going to look at the uh, connection going from one ROI to another one. And if you look at that, this is what we have, and I don't know about you, but I think it's a big mess. 
Uh, I will see, you, know, you can see you've got all these things, all these be beautiful graphs. It's kind of a mess. So let's call it at least by target. So here you know, we've got things that go from to the orbital frontal cortex. You can see that. And maybe it's easier if we just drop these things and just keep at the color. So now we can see that dimension one, uh, if I look at the hour eyes, have one, uh, you have this part going to insula, going to orbital frontal cortex, and also going to orbital frontal cortex. So orbital frontal cortex seems to be responsible for everything there. Now, if we look at the latent variable, this is latent variable one versus two for, uh, the, for the connection, and what we see that everything is packed at the center. Now, we can also use that to try to compute the barycenter of uh, the connection going from one place or going to one place. It's equivalent to an average. Well, let's zoom there so that it's gonna be clearer. And so, you confirm what we've got there, that the going to the orbital frontal cortex is important, going to the insula there, and going from the insula. So this is what we've got on, on that side. Now, can we get uh, the important contribution to the variance? We can do the same thing, and then we're going to find that those are the important regions. So we use the same trick, uh, sum. And two, so once again, we see our favorite culprit orbital frontal cortex there. And from, here we are again for dimension two. So now if we look at the SNP, this is the horrible thing that we have, and it's, it's a mess too. Here I've put the minor allele, here the major one, but still I think we need to color that. So let's try to color at least by a type of gene. So, and this is where we're going, we find that we have COMT, uh, remember, it's dopaminergic, uh, that is really the most important thing on that one, and here uh, we're going to have uh, the RD2. So now if we color, uh, we're going to color again by zygote, trying to find a bit more of the information so we can see where it goes. Now, it's interesting that if we look at the subject, you can see that the same projection I've done, we can see that they are further away. What does that say? Well, that say that you have more variability uh, and therefore more information when you look at the genetic than when you look at the connection. Another way of saying is that the connection pattern there tend to be more similar across subjects than are the genes. And this is what we can actually put them together. And now if we look at the latent variable uh, uh, LX1 versus LX2, what we maximize, you can see that the maximization is not, I mean, it's not that much of a thrill uh, in there. And if we want to know if the Earth is round, we can go to resampling again, and that one through permutation test, or same story, do a permutation, do a, a lot of things, and then we have a H0. We do that over and over again, and the one who told us to do that are now Gosset uh, or, or Fisher, and then now we're going to have our uh, permutation in P.05, and in fact, what we have is not really significant, so we're we are doing something interesting, but we're not going to uh, get our Nobel Prize with that, unfortunately. So, but if we look at what survive um, uh, for factor one, so we have factor one, uh, that does not reach significant factor two, barely. So if we look at all that, now we go back to that and try to see what can survive uh, a bootstrap there, and we've got uh, now the clean version of that. So we're going to see that what survives here uh, uh, is that you have the orbital frontal cortex uh, that once again survive everything. We see that again. And uh, those are the SNPs that survive uh, dimension one. And once again, uh, we see continue. If we look at uh, by a gene there, we can see that we're going to find uh, uh, that big COMT uh, being uh, positive. Now, Let's try to put all that together because uh, we reached the end. So what does survive the bootstrap there? Well, so what survives the bootstrap is, is uh, uh, we can see that we have a connection from VTA to the insula that is linked to DRD2, and we've got our good old COMT, which we could expect to see all over the place. If we try to put that as a graph now, keep what we have, this is what we're going to get, and you can see that everybody's going to the orbital frontal cortex, and you have that, uh, and you have something like is kind of clickish over there, and a separated network there is the one going to the amygdala. So same thing for dimension two, and, and we see again uh, 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 our favorite uh, dopamine uh, regulator, and this is what survived there. So here we've got just two genes there, and the uh, several genes going from that, and that give us the final graph. So it's a lot of things, so we need to wrap that up. So that was our model, and uh, if you uh, uh, put the additional orbital frontal cortex and NAC, this is what we have, and this, we are going to try to put that graph, and if I do put the graph in here, it's a real big mess, I cannot see anything. And what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to uh, 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 look it by sub-network, so this is in fact COMT. This is the network that is mediated by COMT, and this is the one mediated by BDNF, 
And this is the one where we can see the effect of GRD2. So I think it's time now to wrap it up. I think I'm arriving to uh, the, so uh, the, that will be what uh, give us now the sub-network with uh, their own pretty color. And when you can, uh, and remember that dissociated by the fact that you had variability on the gene that is matched by variability in the connection uh, there. And we can find these uh, different uh, mediations. So conclusion there. So we can find a sub-network that are reliably separated uh, uh, in, in the task. And for the multi-table, so we looked at two types of multi-table analysis. The first one, the question was how can I put uh, correlation matrices together? In other words, can I get something equivalent to analysis of variance on correlation matrices? And the idea was the status family uh, 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 way of uh, doing optimization. And the second part is that can we put together connection if we see them as graph, as zero, one stuff, and, and uh, linking them to gene and behavior, and the answer is yet we can use an old idea, which is the idea of partial least square correlation, and adapt it to the zero, one world, and try to get uh, uh, a nice uh, uh, old stuff called correspondence analysis that is brought in here. And more, but that will be for another time or, or when we are going to talk about that, uh, uh, about more multi-table. And merci. And thank you. So that's your turn. So um, uh, there's a button at the bottom of the microphone, which you need to press. And you see a little red light around the microphone when it's on. So please uh, use that to, uh, to ask questions or make comments. Yeah, you are allowed to speak only when it's red. Okay. Uh, that, was, that was very fast, so I'm not sure I understood everything. But um, I'm sorry if I'm asking the obvious question here. But, oh, please uh, do, on the contrary. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in, in this world of comparing matrices, mm -hmm. uh, uh, how do you deal with m multiple comparison correction, things like that? Oh, that, that no, you're right, it's a, it's a beautiful stuff. There you, 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 you do that with several ways. One of the ways doing it that when you deal with the bootstrap ratios, and, and, and I didn't comment on that, but so when you deal with the bootstrap ratio, so if you, don't, if you deal with a P.05, you are going to take your bootstrap ratio that works like a T, so the, the P.05 will be two, so you will say anything larger than two is significant at P.05. Now, if you do that, indeed, you are, you are likely to get a, a multiple comparison problem. So in general, the trick is that you are going to take a, a, a much tougher threshold. So you are going to threshold, so if you want to be completely extreme, you are going to use a Bonferroni-like. So if you have a 10,000, you are going to uh, use a bootstrap ratio around 3.5 or something like that. And the advantage after that, I don't know if you remember the way these things go, they, uh, when you are around four or five, you have something that is extremely stringent. Now, if you do that, you can end up with the inverse problem, the problem of overcorrection. And, and so the, it's one of these, uh, uh, I would say, artistic part when you never exactly know where you are. For sure that if you don't correct, you are likely to have, uh, to have false alarms. Right, so, the, so you don't have uh, kind of uh, uh, models of how things are related in your matrices, like the uh, structures of your matrices could possibly help you in the same way that in Imogen you have uh, to account for smoothness of the data and things like that. Uh, uh, no, elaborate on that. Because we have the same problem in imaging. Okay. That, that's always the same problem when we look at, uh, no, when we do standard imaging, when you want to find, uh, if you use, for example, PLS uh, in standard uh, brain imaging, you have the same problem of trying to correct for the multiple comparison. Or you are thinking about using random field or something like that? I'm not really thinking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're not thinking, OK. <laughs> Can I make a comment on that? So, oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I think that's been a little too conservative. Um, so if you have a single component mm -hmm. uh, which is driving the structure in your data, then the correct degrees of freedom, if you want to go null hypotheses, even mm -hmm. though we don't believe in them, I like predictive models which is the alternative. Um, you want a degrees of freedom that is not the most conservative that you just proposed mm -hmm. where you assume everything is independent and mm -hmm. in the best case, everything is correlated and your result doesn't need any correction whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what you were sort of getting at. If there was one single component and that said that these pieces of the pattern are relatively highly correlated with each other, 
then they're all tending to do the same thing and you certainly don't want to correct for how many of them there are because they're really just one degree of freedom. Mm -hmm. So under those conditions, what do you do? There is no test or standard technique that I'm aware of. You, you, you mean if, you, if your data are completely unspherical, so you, you, you have a component that is screaming well, at you? Well, imagine, uh, you know, you have a thousand variables, 100 of them are correlated with value one, mm -hmm. and the other, you know, the rest mm -hmm. are just random mm -hmm. noise, and when you do a PCA, provided there's enough structure in whatever the prior transformations mm -hmm. you did are, it'll be driven by those hundred variables. Yeah. But because they're perfectly correlated, you certainly don't want to correct. Yeah, no, no, including you're, that number. You're of right. I th but in, in that case, you have a lot, uh, and something that uh, that you see over and over again in the literature on PCA and discovered by several people, several fields. Uh, you have the idea that you need to correct by the num by what you can call the dimensionality of your space, and and then you know, it goes. You, you have uh, ID that are cognate to that, that were like the idea of Frezel, for example, when you, you have, that, that was not really the dimensionality, but that was the same ideas to try to find the equivalent of the number of generators of, uh, of your data. And, but then, and, and you know, because you, you, you wrote on that, yeah, but the, you, after that you have the problem of how can I trust my estimation of the number of components? And a, a lot of, of your own work, I don't know if you're going to talk about that after that uh, in your own talk, but a lot of your work seem, seem to really indicate that, that when you do imaging, that it says if you have two or three spaces that are mixed together, each of them with these different eigenspaces. Now remember, we've talked about that a couple of times, and, and uh, are you going to talk about it in your... Maybe you can tell me if I'm talking about it when I get to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, 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 I'll stop you during your talk. This is what I was talking about. So, so my, my view of the way you correct for that is you build a predictive model. You just completely abandon this whole null hypothesis charade that we're caught in, which is all dependent on inferential assumptions, which also certainly don't apply in your data anyway. And that's actually a problem in Bootstrap because Bootstrap assumes IID data and the chances that your individual subjects are actually IID in any real world problem that we are working with is probably close to zero. Uh, so you've got to come up with some sort of individual subject transformation which somehow makes them closer to IID, which is what I actually think the name of the game is if you're going to go down these resampling routes. Pierre, so, Pierre, do you have something to say about that? Yes, actually, <laughs> yes, I you have. have a comment on that. Well, um, ID in real world is like you and me. Uh, and yeah, at the group level, I think data is uh, fairly uh, ID. I mean, for a given population. And um, there are several generalizations of bootstrap to take uh, correlation into account. Thing is, like, I didn't quite follow all the technical details of the PLS gene mm -hmm. connectome oh, we analysis. We can talk more detail about that um, if you want. But yeah, I believe there's probably a way to find a resampling scheme which would preserve the, the correlation you're interested in. Here, I guess it would be the correlation between connections. So that, yeah, that's slightly tricky, but uh, mm -hmm. like t typically in the type of work I do, I try to preserve spatial correlations. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if, if, you, if you resample in time using some kind of block, well, little time windows, you can preserve both uh, spatial and temporal correlations to some extent. Uh, yeah, I think it, this is the kind of things I was getting at. So, for example, you can you can imagine applying uh, uh, graph theoretical analysis to find structures in your net network, and then use these structures uh, as an information you feed into your bootstrap analysis, and that will uh, take care of some of the correlation in your data. Well, I, I actually, d during my presentation, I'm, I'm going to use exactly that idea. Right. To, to use clustering to extract like the, the major structure and then uh, perform analysis at this scale where you actually reduced the, the amount of, of dependence in your data. Yeah, so that was a very impressive uh, talk. Um, I heard you say that you were using Granger causality mm -hmm. analysis. Um, and is it correct that those uh, last results, those slides with the arrows, that that was the directionality? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So last year at the Organization for Human Brain Mapping meeting in Quebec, there was a talk by Victor Solo. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen it. 
It was all about do not use Grand yeah, Causality. Yeah, no, I completely agree with it. The, the reason why we, we, we put that caveat saying that, okay. well, we use Grand Causality, but we are not believers. Of course, okay, okay, okay good. So, but it, um, it, 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 I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. I started but, to play around with it too, but at that point I saw so many people saying, well, it is just false then, because... Oh, no, but re remember, actually... remember, all our tools, all our methodology are false. Aye, aye, aye. Okay. okay. So <laughs> now that we start with that, yeah. you know, it's, it's just a problem that is more or less, and, and, yeah. it's, and in some cases it's not too wrong. Okay, okay. No, well, so. <laughs> no, but, but particularly my question yeah. is actually, so what, um, do you think that it is uh, doable in a way with the TR that you're using? And what was the TR? Because the, the sampling rate is probably around three seconds or something like that. Yeah, so do you remember that, uh, Derek? Uh, no, I don't. Um, <laughs> but typical. For, and, and do you think it's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think about the whole discussion of can you or can you not do it? Well, I think you've got a trace of it. Like, like any of these things working on the time series, the, uh, if you have a huge signal, it's going to, you are going to see something. Now, if you have uh, the problem is that when you are in the uh, model stuff. Now, if I'd made the choice of, of, of uh, looking at the time series, I would not have chosen Grange causality. But that, you know, it's, you are in the team. <laughs> and, and some of the team likes that. And it's also part of the problem in uh, very often what we do is that we know that we do something that is not exactly what we want, but we're trying to replicate something. And, and, and I mean, I remember that I had something like that, with, I think we talked about that uh, several years ago, when we had the problem about doing uh, uh, factor rotation in fractal analysis. Okay. And I remember once we did a paper and when we were working on face recognition years and years ago with Alice Otto, and, and, and we had done a beautiful analysis with standard PCA, the result was super clear, and we had one reviewer blasting us because said we were not doing a factor rotation like one of the papers we were replicating, which was a gorgeous paper by John Vokey and, and, uh, and Reed uh, from Canada. So uh, anyway, to tell you the story, sometimes after that, I finally uh, uh, met John Vokey and we become friends. I told him, I told him, you know, we had that problem with that paper, and, and then he told me well, I, that he was one of the reviewers, but he was not the one saying that we should do rotation. I told him, uh, so how come you did the rotation in your paper? Because we had that, that reviewer just bugging us for that. He said, he told me, well, you know, the only reason why he did the rotation is because the reviewer bugged him. You know, and, and, and it just uh, that somewhere, one paper was done with the rotation, and then after that, we had to suffer through the problem of replication. So you could say that I could have had guts and thought, uh, you know, like Matt. But anyways, when I did the rotation, I thought that, that the story was still the same. And you know, it's easier to please a reviewer by saying we did, we replicated indeed, mm -hmm. rather than, than having to explain why you don't. So I think in, in the story of the Grand is, is in part that. Now, I agree with you that in, it, at some point we reach the threshold when people say, but we should not do that now. So, so, and then say, well, now we're going to stop doing that. But you see the, the, the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And by, by now you see many more papers coming out do, mm -hmm. applying it than, um, than uh, hard evidence for why it is not yeah. possible. Um, I was actually waiting for, for instance, Victor Solo to publish <laughs> to his make a, points. Yeah, a, a and point. I have not seen that yet. So, I mean, it's great mm -hmm. that you're applying it. And but I, I think it's, it's true. It's, it's also true that, that it's something like any of these techniques, you know, they, they are... We are not going for the absolute truth. No, they're then. not we go perfect. For, you know, if it's, it's yeah. not even a good enough, let's say maybe it's, it's not too bad. Yeah, very clear. Pierre. So I have a very unspecific question because I, I don't really yet understand the, the details of the analysis mm -hmm. you, you presented at the end, but I, I see a lot of potential in those analyses for things like in Alzheimer's disease, there's mm -hmm. a huge heterogeneity in, in the pathology, really it's more mm -hmm. spectrum than a, a mm -hmm. single pathology. And people approach that by essentially symptoms and they try to, to characterize better and better cognitive mm -hmm. deficits and make like all those subgroups. And then they try to see what's changing in their brain. The other way approaching that is to say, let's, let's classify the brains mm -hmm. and see what are the symptoms that come with them. Mm -hmm. We can actually try to classify connectomes. So you use the type of connectivity yeah, yeah. measurements you're doing to define subgroups of patients. And, but if you're doing that, I mean, there, there's many ways to decompose them uh, just based on, on connectivity because there is a huge heterogeneity mm -hmm. across individuals. And what I'm wondering is that if that kind of technique would, could be used to sort of inform on, on the factors you would want to use, yeah. so sort of like merge connectomes and mm -hmm. uh, cognitive measures. To, yeah, no, to exactly. That was, okay. In fact, that was one of the ideas that was behind the development of, of the PLSCA. And, and, and that was, what we, in fact, we started to develop that 
uh, little, uh, that was already on the problem of substance abuse and, and problem like that. But it, the idea was literally to try to put behavior with genetics at, at first. And so we had uh, uh, the SNP, the genetic marker, and we realized that that's, it's one of the cases the, the, that the code, the 0, 0, 1, 2, was making no sense, so that we needed to use a nominal code there. But then realized that when you, you have questioned, the, no, most of the question, the uh, neuropsychology or the uh, psychiatric questionnaire, I in fact uh, uh, look like a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but literally they, those are different pardon of answers. And the trick was to see if we can uh, put now behavior uh, in connection with genetic now, the funny thing that we found, you know, the, and it is what I love in these results is that they go against one of our intuition, is that we tend to think that uh, connection, uh, you know, are, are a clear pattern, and you can say that connection are more noisy, in fact, than genes. But when you put now a gene with behavior, this is the inverse. Genes are much more noisy than behavior. The behavior of people is incredibly stable. And, and, and the genes that are linked to that are, n are not at all that causal, if you want, you know, when you look at uh, the association. But now, if you have indeed something like uh, a different pathology, or even uh, a pathology that you suspect is not uh, homogeneous, like Alzheimer, or uh, well, MCI, I think, is even clearer uh, uh, in terms of being not homogeneous, because literally it's, it's a big mess when you look at, uh, at, at uh, the MCA, MCI population. And indeed, the idea would be that to take either the genes or, and or the behavior, you, uh, or take both of them to try to see if you dissociate these groups on the behavior rather than only on the, uh, uh, let's say, on, only on the brain uh, imaging. So the answer is yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, merci. Um, I noted that uh, in your analysis of the addiction data, or the marijuana mm -hmm. user data, you extract out seven brain regions. Mm -hmm. And you say it gets difficult if you have more brain regions. Mm -hmm. But a lot of work on brain connectivity now is looking at massive connectivity mm -hmm. matrices. with yeah. thousands and thousands of points with all the correlation mm. connections between them. How do these methods scale up to look at a finer grained uh, uh, connectivity I, 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 I think that, that's one of the big, big point and big question. I think the, uh, if we want them to scale up on, on big thing, even when you look at the 152 uh, region that we had, uh, we need absolutely to have a way, if we want to keep the, uh, uh, the picture uh, aspect, because a lot of these things are, are work on the fact that, that we are good at detecting pardon visually. And then I think that something is missing in, in this technique that we don't have a good way of representing these techniques in order that the information is shining ju just, just right there. And what I've done there, and I can tell you I'm not happy with that, what I've done so far is to try to eliminate the, the, the noise and saying what if we are lucky, we're just going to find a number of uh, our eyes that is small enough that we can look at them, just like what we did with the, the example with the data of Cheryl and, and Natasha, in that when what, uh, the, we wound up having so many uh, of these connections, you, you look at you have, you have bars after bars after bars, and then you have the problem that you have so many things that you cannot make a, a natural integration, and, and which is the reason why after that I wound up with a smaller number. Pierre, you look like you have something. Like the, it's the idea that by ruling out the noise, you're going to come up with a simpler story. But it's, it's, it's the hope, but... Yeah, but unfortunately, I don't think that's a good <laughs> idea. There's a, a paper by González Castillo's uh, Bendentini's last mm -hmm. author, where they took four subjects mm -hmm. and 100 run per subject, mm -hmm. and they ran a, 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 an activation study, mm -hmm. and they found significant activation in 96% of the brain. And, I mean, something everybody suspected, uh, mm -hmm. in, in the SPM book, the chapter by Keith mm -hmm. Worsley, he was saying that if we had, you know, massive data, we, everything's significant. Yeah. So we, we think, find we come up with other ways to summarizing the, the information that pure, pure significance, unfortunately, yeah, I believe so. No, but we, sti we still have the problem of, of finding a representation so that if you want the conclusion that we have just, you know, a good picture is so that you look at the picture and say, wow, it's there. And, and now, remember when, in fact, when we're, a lot of the time we spend on the first part uh, uh, there, was well, just to try to find, can we get just a way of making the representation so that the information that is important can be seen right away? Because in, if you end up with, uh, uh, with a connection matrix, so you've got 152 by 152, or if you do a vox, uh, for parcellation, you're going to end up with, let's say, 10,000 by 10,000, and then you're going to have a monster stuff where you, you end up that everything is connected to everything in the universe. So, I mean, it's great, philosophically speaking, but th then, you know, the, <laughs> just going to get lost. In, in so, that. I would argue that you can actually, I mean, we routinely project down into a subspace mm -hmm. and then we uh, optimize the subspace to maximize prediction. 
So we're going after the alternative. So we avoid the whole issue of, you know, uh, a p-value is really just a threshold driven by the amount of data you have, which that shows yeah. nicely. So it's sort of silly. Use a small amount of data, you get sparse patterns, use lots of data, and you get dense patterns. So it's a very strange way to do science, in my view. But I think to answer Jim's uh, question, uh, at least in our hands, we've had a lot of success projecting down onto PCA. Mm -hmm. And you can kernelize it, which makes it nonlinear. Mm -hmm. And you have lots of kernels you can use. So in fact, there's a very general natural framework to do exactly what Jim asked for within each of the subjects for your MDS mm -hmm. representations, so I mm -hmm. would argue. And you can then drive that within your resampling scheme as a, a regularizer where you actually choose the size of the subspace. It gets very hard if you try and do that separately for each subject, but if you at least fix that size, so you say, you know, I think there's like, well, just one dimension, for example, quite often does interesting things. Uh, so at least in the multivariate space, I think it is possible to denoise the data usefully. Yeah, but if we work with the idea that, for example, you have a set of data when we have an awful lot of connection and, and they really are, are not noise. So we end up with, with everything. We know that it seems that it's as if, you know, if, you, if you push the story to this extreme, well, we know in the brain everything is connected to everything. No, that, that's almost, a, it's uh, not, not by a direct route, but you've got always a way of going from, from here to there. Yeah. So if you put that as being the extreme thing, so we, we deal with something that is hyper-connected. But if we do that, we lost. Uh, the, the, even for, for me, 100 by one, uh, 100 by 100 matrix, I'm lost. No, it's, it's too much for my... Uh, of, uh, of looking at, at all that, if I want to look at each of the connections. But isn't so that resolved look by looking for the subset of the connections that predict something you're interested yeah. in? I mean, and if you just exactly. do it as a yeah. data discovery exercise, then you'll end up in that situation mm. with enough data. Yeah, well, the, the reason why, in that case, for example, for the connectivity, I, th I thought that we needed to have something else. So, so that if you have something else, it's a way, it, just like in fact in brain imaging, the way of, of trying to get what is the important information is to put the, the activation in correlation with a behavior or in correlation with something else, because this is the dissociation that's going to tell us, well, there is information all over there, but that part is the common information, or this is the information that you will call predictive. I don't think that it's common, because I'm not completely sure that we predict that much there. I think it's common information, but that's, we can argue on, on that on that. 